covering this entire semester, the book of Romans. Quick question, how many chapters does Romans have? Don't be bashful. 16. Every Christian has the same book of Romans with regards to there being 16 chapters. But in experience, it's possible that some Christians have a shorter version of the book of Romans. Some people have a Romans that is only 17 verses. That is Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 17, where you have Martin Luther's famous discovery that the just shall have life and live by faith. And that is a tremendous verse. Yeah. But Romans doesn't stop there. Right. Many Christians have a Romans that actually just goes up to chapter 4, which talks about justification, which is a tremendous truth. Right. But Romans goes beyond chapter 4. And I believe this semester, Christian students has undertaken a faithful review of the key points of the book of Romans week after week, month after month, and I'm so glad that I can be joining you today with Romans chapter 8. And this is such an awesome chapter. It, in fairness, we can spend an entire year on Romans 8, and we'll have to look to the Lord for his leading on how, how much time, perhaps, next semester we spend on this, but this is a crucial chapter. Now before we dive into Romans 8, I want to take a quick review of Romans 7. And we touched on that in previous weeks. And last week our brother Stephen shared a very good word about three laws from Romans 7. And if I may very simply illustrate and give you a sense, uh, you have, ooh, okay. Um, you have, I'm, I'm uh, going to do it this way. Let's say, you know, there's a, there's a person here, okay. It's like a bird man. Um, <laughs> there's a law of God that is outside of this person, right? What's the next one? Who remembers? Law. Good. Yeah, that's right. Did you hear that? Now, where, where, where does the law of good dwell? In our mind. Yeah. So this is... Okay, I'm just going to... And, and this is all in Romans 7. You, you have to, uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a, a quick graphic of it. And then what's the, what's the third law? Sin and sin. Yeah, Yashua, what, louder? The law of sin and death. And where does that dwell? In our flesh. Yeah, so that's almost like basically, you know, this entire... You know, that, that's just who you are. And, and in Romans 7, I, I'd like you to be impressed that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is almost like a natural scientist. And he is making discovery after discovery concerning how these laws operate and govern our entire being. And much like Newton, I guess... They say, I don't know if this is true or not, anecdotally, there's a chair here, so I'll just use it. He's sitting under the apple tree, and the tree, you know, the apple drops, and it, you know, hits him on the head, and he starts thinking about it, and he just, you know, it's the law of gravity. Now, uh, when was Newton born, roughly? Somebody know that. Richard, you better know this. <laughs> you know the exact dates? No. Oh. <laughs> broad, broad strokes? Oh, okay, 1300, three centuries off. <laughs> this is about all I, this is the extent of my superior physics knowledge over you. Um, I think it's like 1642 to 1727. My 10th grade European history teacher forced me to memorize dates, so I still have some of them in my head. Um, you can check on your phone if I'm right, but 
17th to 18th century. Paul in the first century is making a lot of profound discoveries about, in a sense, it's like natural science. He's, and in this chapter, Romans 7, there are 23 instances where there is self-effort, some kind of exertion of, of an attempt to do good, an attempt to be proper, an attempt to fulfill God's standards. And in instance after instance, he fails, right? He is 0 for 23. And there is a realization that there is a law of God that is a standard that is outside of us. There is a law of good that is within our concept that, you know, wants to achieve this. But every time we try to come up to this standard, there's another law, which is the law of sin and death, and that's operating in our flesh. And even though we may temporarily fulfill what we think is this standard, actually, this law will always overcome it, right? Andy, come here for a second. Okay. All right, Andy. Got the Bible? Oh, what's that? It, it, it's... I treasure my Bible, but it's, you know, don't be superstitious. It's just the Bible. Um, what was that? That's the law of gravity. Okay, overcome the law of gravity. Ah, oh, hold it up. Look at that. He's overcoming the law of gravity, right? For how long? How long, brother? Should we just have Andy stand here on the corner? Um, in some cultures, this is a kind of punishment, I think. <laughs> I've never done that, but how long do you think you can hold it? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, right? Yeah, if, especially if it's like that. Okay. Thank you, brother. But you, you see my point. Um, sometimes this law, you can go, back, but sometimes you say, hey, you know, the law of good. I've, I, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I'm corresponding to the law of God, but the law of sin and death eventually always will, will conquer. I'll share another example. Um, you know, I, I have I have a nine-year-old boy, and we have laws around our house. And one of the laws is no playing ball inside the house. Right? It's just it, don't play ball. And 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 then the, so there are balls that he comes back from the park into the soccer ball or basketball, and it's just lying around the you know the front. And it's like, okay, hey. Put the ball away in the, in, you know, there's a little ball basket. Put the balls away in the ball basket. So, this is my son. There's a law there, no playing ball in the house. And I see him, I see him. And we say, hey, put the balls away, clean up. And I can see in his mind, he's like, okay, I'm going to try to put the ball away. And even though there's only like 10 feet to go from where the ball is to the ball basket, you know, he's holding the ball, and you can just see in his head, <laughs> keep the law, keep the law, listen to mom, listen to dad, but like, without fail, before he gets to that basket, he just has to start dribbling it, <laughs> or if it's a soccer ball, you know, he's holding it, and then he just starts, you know, dribbling, and then, like, you know, what's that, that's the law, that's the law of sin and death, he just, he just can't, and I just watch it, and it's, it's like science. <laughs> there's, a, there's a law of piano practicing in our house. You have to practice the piano for a little bit. And when you practice, you know, practice properly. So, right, that's the law. And I can see him in his piano practicing. He's, you know, trying to practice. But without fail, near the end of every song, he cannot help, you know, you know, he's, he's doing his best to practice, but near the end, without fail, he has to go, -na 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 -na. <laughs> like every time. And that's, <laughs> again, you, you, you see my point, right? There's the law that tries, you know, there's something in his head that's trying to correspond with the law of the household, but that nine year old, that nine year old within him just can't do it. And, and I don't get mad at, uh, I try not to get mad at him because, you know, that's, and we're all the same. There are the law of God in our minds. We're trying to keep it, but, but we fail. 
And actually, that's why in our daily life, you know, we can have all sorts of almost like split personalities in our living. I was interviewing somebody this week for a job with, with me, and in my job, you have to be a really strong negotiator. So I asked this woman, I said, what's your negotiation style? And she said, well, when you first meet me, I'm Pleasant Patty. But if you cross me, then I will become no-nonsense Nancy. And then if you really offend me, I'll become Angry Annie. I have three personalities. <laughs> I said, it's not a bad answer in a sense, and that's how we are, you know. Sometimes, Evan, in the morning, you, uh, you contact God, you have some prayer in the morning, and, you know, you're God-man Evan. Um, but then you get to campus, your day goes on, something happens, you know, you're married, you know, we know how it is, something, and then by the, you know, middle of the day, you're, you're, you're no longer God-man Evan. Now you're, you know, fallen Evan, right? Uh, and then, and then maybe at the end of the day, you, you know, you, you apologize and say, "Hey, Tiffany, I'm sorry for offending you." And that, then you're kind of back to normal. But, but, but that's how we are. Now, if you go through Romans seven, I would say there's one word that can summarize the entirety of Romans chapter seven, based on this illustration. Check with your neighbor. Ask your neighbor, what is the one word that summarizes all of Romans 7? Okay, who's got a word? Toss it out. Don't be embarrassed. Sam, what's your word? Law. Law. Okay, not bad. Fail. Fail. That's closer, I think, to, to, to my uh, own selected answer. <laughs> Who else? Will. Will. Very close. Good. I, the, the thought is all the same. How about on that road? That road. Jennifer, Razel, got hopeless. hopeless. Wretched. Wretched. Those are all good words. The word that I would submit best captures the sentiment of Romans 7 is cannot. No. Cannot. Cannot. So cannot. <laughs> That's his conclusion. Cannot. Let's read the title of message 11 all together. Ready? Go. The dispensing of God as life. Now I mentioned Romans 7, and I have one verse here from Romans 7. There are 23, that was my count, 23 instances of self-effort. And there is this conclusion, and Stacy, you're right. Let's read Romans 7.24 all together. Ready? Go. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then I included Romans 8.8 8 here. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That verse is really a summary of his experiences in Romans 7. And so whether it's cannot, or the use of the will, or hopeless, or being under the discovery of these laws, that's the experience of Romans 7. And if you, now I've kind of used childish examples to make the illustration, but now I speak more uh, seriously because we are all under this experience. And if you are living this kind of life, which we all have, then there is a degree of, there should be a degree of desperation within all of us that we wouldn't be in this endless loop of Romans chapter 7. And that feeling is there in that first verse. Wretched man that I am. It's no joke anymore. You can't live this way. What kind of life is this? This is not the Christian life. To be in this endless, fruitless cycle of self-effort, a little success, and then a lot of failure. That is not the Christian life. So, and, and when you realize it's a law, it's a law, that brings in desperation. So to make the transition from Romans 7 to Romans 8 requires a little discovery, but more importantly, it requires a particular attitude. 
and that is Romans 8 is a chapter for desperate seekers of the Lord. I'd like to ask you, are you a desperate seeker of the Lord? I know you're all seekers to be here this morning, but to be brought into the experience of Romans 8, there needs to be a degree of desperation. Because you see the law and you see the futility of our own exercise. It's with some degree of irony that I'm here this morning speaking to you all about a law. I, some of you know that I, I teach uh, a class at the Gould School, School of Law. Um, and that's par- partially why I haven't been able to be here earlier this semester. Every week it's just kind of pressing on me and now I'm near the end of the semester and uh, just like for you students, for the teachers, the end is near as well. And I take that class very seriously. I'm with a group of very bright law students and we're teaching about, talking about principles of the law. And as seriously as I take that class, I would have to say that what we have covered this semester, what I'll share this morning, even in the next 10 minutes or so, is of so much more consequence is of so much more importance. My 25 minutes of sharing this morning in terms of eternal significance is much greater than that class I teach. Because we're talking not about man-made laws, nor even natural laws, but we're going to talk about a wonderful person and how he operates as a law. Okay, so now let's turn to these verses. Uh, In Romans, we're going to read through these verses. I need to make one more important point about Romans 7.24. Paul says, Wretched man that I am, what will deliver me from this body of death? Right? No. No. How will I be delivered from this body of death? Right? No. no. What does Paul say? Ooh. Louder? Ooh. Louder! Ooh. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So Paul was in Romans 7 in a cycle of failure and self-effort. But he realized he did not need a method. He did not need a self-help tutorial. He did not need some... Uh, you know, some method of, of overcoming, but he needed a person. He needed a person. Who? Who? So we're going to talk about this wonderful who, okay? Let's read, how about all the sisters read Romans 8, 1 through 2. Ready? Go. There is now then no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed me from the law of death and death. Amen. Now, I want to use these next uh, four verses to, all from Romans 8, to show you who this wonderful person is and the process that this wonderful person went through. Okay, so let's have uh, the sisters read Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Ready? Go. For that which the law could not do, in that it was deep through the flesh, God sending his own son the likeness of the flesh of sin and concerning sin, and the sin in the flesh. Okay, there's a lot there, but to quickly go through it, what do we see here concerning Christ? What's the, what's the, uh, what process, what steps has God in Christ gone through based on this verse? What's the first one? How about, yeah, Tim, what is it? Sent his own son. Yes. Well, so what's that in, in our New Testament terms? Incarnation. Yes. Right? Incarnation. Okay. But well, you see that. God became a man. Yeah. Okay. What's after this? How about you keep going, Tim? Uh, condemned sin in the flesh. Condemned sin in the flesh. What does that refer to? Uh, his death. Yes. Right? The cross? 
or his crucifixion. This is a little shorthand. But in this one verse, you see God becoming a man. This man, of course, passed through human living, went to the cross. Okay, how about the next verse, uh, Romans 8.11. Is that the brother's turn? Brothers, Romans 8.11. And then the sisters, get ready. You need to identify the steps here. Brothers, go. And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who indwells you. Yes. Okay. So what's the big step we see in that verse concerning what Christ has passed through? How about a sister? Esther, what is it? Yes, hallelujah. So, right, we know after the cross, right, you know, he was in the grave, but then we see resurrection. Uh, Romans 8 11. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Now, let's jump to the next verse, Romans 8 34, all together. Ready? Who is he who condemns? It is Christ Jesus who died and rather who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So there's something here, more, more than just being raised. What's the, what's, the, what's the significant step seen in this verse? Who has it? Mikhail, you see it? That's a big one, but... Yes, what does that mean, Anna? Yes, that's the right word, ascension, all the way, you know, this means he keeps on going to the right hand of God. And so in these sequence of verses, I hope you'd be impressed who this person is. This is the person, this is God becoming a man, passing through human living, going to the cross to die, and in this death, it was a death which condemned sin, that is, judged sin, took care of sin, and entered into resurrection and entered into ascension. This is our wonderful Christ. This is our experience of salvation. And what I'd like to impress you with, this wonderful person is now operating within us as a law. And this is, this will, this will take a little concept adjustment. But everybody sees this process, right? Aren't you encouraged? In, in, in a few chapters, and a few verses in this chapter, we see the process of God. And now that on the one hand he has ascended and is at the right hand of God, but let's also read 1 Corinthians 15.45b. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So while Christ in his ascension is at the right hand of God, Christ is also the life-giving spirit. And as such, such a Christ, actually, now I'm going to uh, <laughs> cross over. Okay, you're following me. This Christ, I'm totally messing up the diagrams now. But this Christ is now operating within us as... And what's he dispensing? Life. Life. He's gone through this process, and, and it's here in these verses, right? I, I go back to Romans 8.11. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life. give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who indwells you. So... You have to see that God in Christ has passed through these processes and now he is a spirit indwelling us, giving us life. Amen. But the emphasis I'd like to give this morning, if you look at Romans 8.2, the second half of the third verse on your sheet, it's so striking that Paul did not say, for Christ has freed me from the law of sin and of death. Or Jesus has freed me. But there is this really striking phrase used for the first time in the New Testament. For the law of the spirit of life 
has freed me in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and of death. And so what I'd like you to be impressed with, brothers and sisters, is that just as these three laws in Romans 7 were operating, Paul then described and actually explained God's process and God's current function and operation within us using the same term as a law. As a law. That means something that is a fixed principle. Something that you cannot change. Something that in a sense does not require your own effort. But God is now operating within us as a law. And this is a description of Christ. He is God who has become a man, who went through death, was resurrected, ascended, and is now dwelling in us, and I have to write this out now, as the law of the Spirit of life. To impress you with how important this is, let me use another example. You know, laws govern human life. Uh, our human lives are governed by laws. Okay, college students don't know this necessarily, but there is such a thing called the law of sleep. <laughs> It, it's there. That means you have to sleep. And if you don't sleep enough, then your body just gets messed up, you get unhealthy, and you say, oh, I'm going to take some, you know, airborne and I'll be fine. And there's a law of sleep. And if you violate that law, you just get messed up. And just like there's a law of sleep, there's a law of sin and death, there is the law of the spirit of life. And I'm so impressed that for Paul to use law, Paul was saying that he understood the way God operates in humanity. And, and that's something you should remember. When Paul uses the word law, in this context, he's saying, I am explaining to you how God operates in humanity. God has passed through this process and he is now dwelling in you as the law of the spirit of life. There is this untapped wealth of riches within us, in our bodies, in our spirit, where Christ dwells. But if we're not aware of it, this law will not benefit us. Here's an example. Um, I was at an airport a few weeks ago, and I looked around and everybody was on their computers. Um, and I said, oh man, I wish I had a good data plan so I can get online. I just looked around with envy at all these people. They're all on their computers and they're all, they're all doing things. They're very productive and I, I hate being unproductive. And I'm there, I'm, like, I'm not being productive, waiting for my flight. And then I realized, Oh, the airport has free Wi-Fi. That's why everybody's, everybody's connected, except me. See, I didn't realize there was a law of free Wi-Fi in the airport lounge. Now, what I had to do was, I realized the, the wealth is there, so I had, to, I had to connect. I had to connect. And I connected, I logged on, and I was able to tap into the wealth of the internet. <laughs> okay, that's a physical example. Spiritually, brothers and sisters, there, is, there are the riches of all of God through all of his processes dwelling within our spirit, but we have to connect. We have to be in a fellowship with this one. And if we are, he functions as a law to free us and to save us from the law of sin and of death. Now what was wrong about this Wi-Fi illustration is you just connect once 
and then you're basically connected, you know, as long as you're within range. This kind of connection here, and we don't have the time to describe them all, but let's read Romans 8, 4 through 6, and we'll be done shortly. Let's read the, the third to last set of verses, Romans 8, 4 through 6. Ready? Go. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is, is life and peace. Amen. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. So this is Paul's big clue about how do you connect to this law. It is about setting your mind on the Spirit. And so we don't have the time to discuss all the ways the mind is set on the Spirit. But I would like to impress you that Romans 8 presents a very experiential Christ. Romans 7 was full of negative experiences, but Romans 8, there are some unfamiliar words, but nothing about it is doctrinal. Nothing is academic. You look at even the verses we've excerpted here, giving life to your mortal bodies. The mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. This is Paul's explanation of how God operates in us. And the best way for us to cooperate is to set our mind on the Spirit. When we set our mind on the Spirit, that is our Wi-Fi connecting. That is our connecting and bringing in the riches and the resources. So let me summarize uh, this little portion in this way. Romans 8 shows us a desperate seeker a desperate seeker who is done, failing, doesn't want to be in the cannot cycle of Romans 7, and who has come to understand that God has passed through such a process to become indwelling with, within us and to operate as a law. And whenever we fulfill the conditions, that is, set our mind on the Spirit, then in our experience we have all the untapped, formerly unknown benefits of God living it within us. We have supply, we have overcoming, we have release, we have emancipation, all of that is within us. And that is God giving himself as life to us.